Over the past few weeks, our pastor's been doing a series called Famous Roads of the Bible. And when he asked me to fill in for him a couple weeks ago, um, my mind immediately went back to uh, probably one of those phrases that every one of us has heard and probably maybe even used from time to time. How many of y'all have ever heard that all roads lead to heaven? Anybody ever heard anybody say that? Anybody ever maybe even said that from time to time, right? So I thought about that. I said, that's probably a road we need to know more about because at the end of the day, it probably matters if we are on the right road or not on the right road. Make sense? So we're going to examine that truth from Scripture this morning and take a look at that. So if you don't mind, would you open your Bibles this morning and stand with me as we read from John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 6. And let me go ahead and read and just follow with me, please. Well, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No, no one comes to the Father except through me. Father, we just ask your, your deepest blessings on the reading of your word this morning. Father, I ask that you open our hearts and our minds that as the Holy Spirit goes through this place this morning, that you will just guide us in all truth, Father God, and speak to us. And Father, help us to not only hear you, but respond in complete obedience. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated if you don't mind. I'm going to start off with a little wonky way of starting a service this morning, which is probably not unusual. But anyway, I'm going to do a deep dive on these six verses, but we're going to do it in just a few minutes. I want to start off by looking first and asking the question, which is the hundred year question, the hundred year question. I want you to stop for just a second, close your eyes, and I want you to think, where are you going to be a hundred years from today? Think about that for just a second, right? Where are you going to be a hundred years from today? Well, if you're alive, you're probably drooling in your oatmeal, but more than likely you're not, right? So when you stop and you think about it, according to the Bible, you're either going to be in the presence of God or you're going to be eternally separated from God. There is no middle ground. You're either going to be with or you're not going to be with God for eternity. Now, whether that's a hundred years or five years or five minutes, we don't know God's timing, but at the end of the day, it's kind of important that you start with the end in mind. That makes sense? I've often said that one of the things that should go into every count marriage counseling session is they need to go to Ikea and buy a piece of furniture and have to put it together. <laughs> if they still like each other after that project, then they have a shot at marriage, but that's another story, right? But if you ever looked at a piece of furniture like that, You'll notice that it has about 8 million pieces to it, and if you don't have that picture, you're thinking, oh, how is this ever going to come together, right? So I'm going to start off by doing something just a little bit different. Can you put up that picture of Alice, please? How many of y'all have ever seen the movie Alice in Wonderland? Anybody? If you had kids, you've probably seen it 112 times, right? I can recite large portions of the movie, I'm afraid. But our oldest daughter, uh, she happened to think she was Alice. So we sat there, in fact, she's watching from uh, Kenya this morning. My daughter's a missionary in Kenya. She's actually watching the live stream. So I probably just burst her bubble. Sweetheart, you're not Alice, right? But I'll go ahead and just share that with you. But she thought she was for all that time, right? So if you listen, and you can't help but listen when the kids are watching these movies over and over. You know how I'm going, right? But there's a famous part in that particular movie that you see illustrated in this particular, particular picture, and it's where Alice is, comes to a fork in the road. And all of a sudden, she looks up and she sees this Cheshire cat up in the tree, and she asks that question. Tell me, sir, which way should I go? The Cheshire cat responds, well, where are you going? I don't know, sir. He said, well, it doesn't matter what road you take then, right? So if you stop and you think about it, if you don't begin with the end in mind, if you don't know where you're going, it might not matter what road you take, but if you happen to believe what the Bible says and what the Bible says is true, 
it might be important that you can answer that question. Would y'all agree with that? So I want to kind of think about something. I'm going to bring up three maps, and I need your help with something this morning. So study these very carefully. Go ahead and put up the first one if you don't mind. This is I-10. Now, for any of you that know what I-10 is, it starts on the Atlantic Ocean in Jacksonville, Florida, at the ocean, and it goes all the way across the country, and it ends in Santa Monica, California, at the Pacific Ocean over there, right? So help me out here. You ready? Everybody get in your car, and I need you to jump on I-10 in Houston and start heading toward L.A. Can we do that? Now, the good news is, is when you get out in West Texas, the speed limit out there is about 85, so you can make good time out there. But if you were on I-10, how long would it take you to get to Dallas? <laughs> Why are you laughing? Go ahead and put up that next map, if you don't mind, please. Now, for those of you that, of course, this freeway is never going to be finished. That's another story for another day, right? But... <laughs> by 2062 when they finish that thing. But if you were on I-45 today, I-45s run north and south, right? So once again, if you got on I-45 in downtown Houston, how long would it take you on I-45 to get to LA? If the men here are thinking, I'm still not gonna stop and ask for directions, right? <laughs> so. Put up the last map if you don't mind. And this is the infamous 610 loop. It's exactly 55 miles around. Don't ask me how I know that. It's just, I know that, right? But starting from the city center, these, this goes out about 10 miles just outside of city center all around Houston, right? So if you got on I-610, if you got on 610 today, and you started driving on 610 today, how long would it take you to get to downtown? How long would it take you? Now, there's places you'll be really close, but you'll never get there because 610 doesn't go to downtown. I-10 doesn't go to Dallas, and I-45 doesn't go to L.A., but yet somehow we can use that credible statement that all roads lead to heaven even though the road doesn't go there. Everybody with me? So think about that, and I'm going to leave these images in your head for just a little while. But I thought for a second, if that statement is true, then it should be verifiable by basically what we do. So before I move on, though, can I get you all to do me a big favor? I just thought I'd do this for right quick. My daughter is watching, and I want her to know that we still think about, pray for her. So on three, can everybody say at the same time, hi, Elizabeth? Will you do that for me? One, two, three. Hi, okay, that'll cost you, sweetheart. All right. <laughs> I want you to help, right? Take some of these notes down. So I started thinking as I was going back through some of my uh, different journals and books that I have, let me see. If all roads lead to heaven, what if I look at what each of the major world religions say, right? Because it should be very clear about where you're going to spend eternity if you follow their doctrines and their teachings. Does that make sense? So let's take a look, because if we think about biblical Christianity, then basically it says that for those of us that are Christians, we not only believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, that he came, he taught, he modeled for us what he you know, how to live a Christ-centered life. He went to the cross and paid for your sin, debt, and mine. Three days later, he rose again and defeated death. And even now, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. So if you believe that, you've been baptized, basically, you know where you're going to spend eternity. So as soon as you take that last breath, you're going to be into the very presence of God himself. Make sense? So if that's the entrance fee to heaven then everybody should be lined up there, right? So let's take a peek and see just how closely that aligns. So if you don't mind, I'm going to have to read some of these just to make sure I get them right. So the first one is, is how many of you have ever had those wonderful people visit you knocking on your door from the Jehovah Witness? Anybody? We've probably all had a chance to meet and greet and 
Uh, they don't come to my house anymore because I love to visit with them, right? But it's just kind of fun to sit and find, understand what they, they believe. Now, according to their doctrine, it says that in order to earn eternity in the presence of God, that you have to be baptized as a Jehovah Witness, and you have to work going door by door, and basically how effective you are going door by door earns you the right to get into the presence of God. But there's one other small thing, that heaven is going to be limited to 144,000 people, and since those slots are already taken, the only shot that you have is to live a completely righteous life for 1,000 years, otherwise you'll be annihilated. Okay? So does that sound like biblical Christianity, about the same spot? Mm, not really. So let's try another one. Fair enough. How about Mormonism? According to the Mormon uh, teachings, they say salvation is based on works. And according to their own doctrines, it says in order to get to what they call, refer to as heaven, you have to, have faithful, uh, you have to be faithful to the Mormon leadership. You have to be, uh, have a Mormon baptism. You have to tithe. You have to have an ordination service. You have to have a Mormon marriage and secret temple rituals. Now, there is no such thing as eternal life if you're not part of the Mormon church. Eventually, everyone goes to one of three heavenly kingdoms. And if you're really, really sharp, you actually become a godhead in one of those places. But apostates and murderers go to a place of eternal torment. So once again... Does that sound like biblical Christianity and the same place? But all roads lead to heaven, right? Hmm, maybe I was wrong. So how about Christian science? Now, according to Christian science, there is no heaven, no hell. There's simply a state of mind. There's no such thing as evil, sin, sickness, and death are not real. And basically, what, according to what they teach, you just cease to exist when you die. Islam, all humans are basically good, but fallible need, gu need guidance. The balance between good and bad deeds are to determine your destiny to eternal life, right? But because of that, they count on Allah tipping the balance toward heaven. If I have a couple of more good works than bad works, it'll tip the scale that way. But the neat part is, is paradise is populated with urus or maidens designed by Allah to bring sexual pleasure to all the righteous men for all eternity. Sounds like heaven. <laughs> Buddhism. The goal of life is nirvana, to eliminate all cravings or desires. And in this way, they escape suffering. There's an eightfold path by which you're required to go, and it's to free you from desiring anything until you don't exist anymore. Eternity is through reincarnation, and people do not have their own individual soul or spirit, but one's desires can be reincarnated into another individual. I think we're taking different roads. I could be wrong. Hinduism is all about reincarnation, and part of the reason that they're all vegetarians, they're afraid of eating Uncle Henry and that sort of stuff, right? And then, of course, Judaism is by way of works. Now, you're thinking, why did you go through all of those? At the end of the day, let's be real clear. All roads do not lead to heaven. Everybody good with that, right? You understand that? So let's talk from our text now. So go back and look now at John chapter 14 because it might be important to see what Jesus says. Is that fair? So let's go look at our scripture and do a deep dive here if you don't mind. And when you look at those first few words, it says, do not let your heart be troubled. Now, it's kind of odd when a passage starts off with that because it's probably important that you look back before you look forward. Everybody with me? Now, when you look back at John chapter 13, that's what we call the Last Supper. That's what's taking place. So Jesus is telling these, what he's fixing to share here in the upper room, right? He's just with his apostles. They're just finishing dinner is when this happens. Now, if you look back at the first part of John chapter 13, this is where Jesus takes off his outer garment, wraps himself, gets a basin and some water, and he proceeds to wash the disciples' feet. Fair enough? And as he's beginning to wash their feet, Peter stands up and says, Hey, Lord, that ain't happening. You ain't washing my feet, Lord. And he looks at old Petey and says, 
well, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part of me, into which Peter responds, make sure you get behind the ears, my back, all down my legs, right? So Peter never could quite seem to get all the way on God's page, but that happens. Then they sit down, they have dinner, and this is where Jesus calls out Barabbas. Not, not Barabbas, listen to me. The Judas. I'll get it straight in a second. <laughs> Judas, for his, uh, that he was going to betray him shortly. He says, the man who dips with me, and he looks at Judas and says, all right, get up and go take care of what you need to. And then he looks back at Peter one more time and says, you know, by the way, since I am going to have to be going away soon, be careful because Satan's looking for you. He says, I don't care what everybody else does, but Lord, I'm going to be with you to the end. And Jesus looks at him and says, before the, crow, uh, cro before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me three times. That's the setting that we're seeing for this first verse. Now, do you think that it's going to be any surprise to Jesus what's going to happen in the next 36 hours? Do you think he knew what was coming? Do you think he knew he was going to be taken to the high priest's home and he was going to be unlawfully tried? He was going to be beaten by the palace guards? going to be sent to Pilate for a beating, and then they, the Romans took him out, and they whipped him to almost an inch of his life. He goes to Calvary. He does all of this. Do you think any of that was a surprise to Jesus? With all that on his mind, look at the first words again. What does he say? What does that tell you about Jesus' heart? Let not your heart be troubled. Have you thought about that? Just let that resonate for just a second. That's the same Jesus that I worship today. That's the same Jesus that loves to mend broken hearts. I want you to think about the disciples. You've been with him for three years. You've seen things, you've watched things, you've heard him teach, you've heard him pray, you've seen him do stuff. Would you kind of have an uneasy feeling when you're sitting there? Would you kind of have that little bit of angst where you're kind of thinking, where are you going, Lord? I don't get it. I don't understand. Jesus is a beautiful shepherd. He's an even better Lord, right? But he says this. He says, let not your heart be troubled. And then he says the last part of that. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. Over the last three years, he's seen the lame made to walk. He's seen the blind to, uh, made the blind to see. He's cleansed lepers. He's brought people back from death to life. Remember, we call Lazarus out of the tomb. And they've seen things that would just blow your mind. And all of a sudden, he looks at him and says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. Now, folks... Is there a difference between head and heart knowledge? Sure there is, right? Sometimes the greatest, greatest distance in a person's life is 18 inches from what's in here to transform it to here. And that's the challenge. He says, what you're going to see over the next couple of days is going to kind of test your faith. It's going to really test your faith. It's going to take you to the limit Believe, you believe in God, believe also in me. Don't forget that, right? But look at what he says next. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. I feel sorry for some of you. You probably have rooms in your translation, so you can have a room, I'll take the mansion. But that's another story, right? But when you stop and you think about it, he says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, and then I'll bring you there with me. Are those some of the greatest words ever? I want you to think about that, because when we think about it, there's something sweet that when one of God's saints goes home. It's hard to lose people, but there's a certain peace that comes over people when you know where they're going to be spending eternity. Isn't that kind of a sweet thing? As much as you hate to lose them, as much as you're going to miss them, to know that they're at home in the presence of God himself in a house built for them by Jesus himself for all eternity, does that bring you a great deal of peace or what? That makes sense? 
The fact of the matter is, is I, I was telling somebody just a few minutes ago, I don't see how people who are not Christians get through times like that. I don't see how those that don't have a hope and don't have a Savior get through those kind of times. But it's so easy when you know where they're at. When they took that last breath, they were immediately transported into the very presence of God himself. So when you stop and you think about it, as he says this, uh, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8, it says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. We're confident, confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, I love the next part because look at verses 4 and 5 with me if you don't mind. And he says, Where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Now, it probably is going to sound bad to some of you, but Thomas is one of my favorite of the apostles. Yeah, you know, he's commonly referred to as doubting Thomas and that sort of stuff. But have you ever really thought about it? Isn't Thomas the only one brave enough to ask the question everybody else is thinking? I mean, wouldn't you ask that question? Think about it for just a second. Now, you're always hoping somebody else in the class asks the question, but you're thinking the same thing while he's asking, right? But is that a good question? Is it okay to ask God when you're not sure about something? Shouldn't we have that kind of relationship that we can take what we're cares, concerns to God himself and say, God, help me with this? Isn't that kind of cool, right? Now, Thomas was the only one smart enough to ask the question. He said, Lord, you say we know where you're going, but I have to be honest, I don't know where we're going. What is it? So here's where I want to camp for just a few minutes this morning, and I want you to look now at verse 6. It says this, And Jesus said to him, I am what? The way. And who gets to come to the Father? No one except through me. Now, isn't it awesome how Jesus said he's one of many ways to heaven? Isn't that really cool? Isn't that what it says? I am the way. I am the way. Folks, I hate to break the bubble to some of the current wisdom in our society today, but there's not many paths to heaven. There's one way. I am the way. And then he goes on to say, I am the truth. Now, society today is teaching that as long as it's true to me, it's true. That's called, you know, the new version of truth is as long as it's true for me, then it must be truth. But I've always been told that the real definition for truth is it has to be true for all people in all times and all circumstances. If it's not true to all three of those, then it's not really truth. So just because it's true for me doesn't necessarily make it true for you. Well, if it doesn't, then it's not really truth. But Jesus takes the claim one step farther when he says this. He says, I am not one of many truths, I am the truth, right? So if I make a truth claim, then it must be true or I am not the truth. That makes sense? And then last but not least, he says, the life. Now, when we stop and we really just kind of think about that for just a second, I think back a number of years ago, right before Billy Graham passed away, and he was being interviewed by a reporter, and I'll never forget what he said that day. He said, I'm going to be going home to be with my Lord soon. And you're going to read about in all these papers that Billy Graham died. He said, but that, nothing could be farther from the truth. He said, because when I die, I'm going to be more alive than I ever was here. Amen. Folks, can I just share with you? You're going to be more alive for all eternity as a child of the King than you ever will be here. No sickness, no sorrow, no death, no... It's going to be a place that we, the human mind can't even imagine what it's like, what it's going to be like, what God has prepared for us, right? When we stop and we think about it, that sounds like a pretty exclusionary claim when we stop and kind of really think through it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except what? Through me. Well, folks... This is going to be a fairly short message only for one reason this morning. It's here in a few minutes. We're going to have a chance to celebrate the Lord's Supper. 
My favorite of the two ordinances that God left us with is baptism. And I have to be honest, when I was watching Dennis baptize this morning, I always get kind of giddy because of what it represents. It represents a changed life. You know, somebody has a new identity. They're telling the whole world, I'm a child of the king. There's something better. And like Dennis, I hope that those baptism waters stay full every week for years to come. That makes sense? Is there something special about what that says to the whole world? But a close second to that is the Lord's Supper. And when you think about the Lord's Supper, we're remembering Christ's death, burial, and resurrection in some very simple bread and a cup of juice, right? But what it represents is immense. But folks, here at First Baptist Church, Texas City, we practice what's called an open table. So if you're not a member here, we still invite you to be part of it as long as you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Everybody understand that? So we would hope that you would not only participate, but celebrate with us when we do the Lord's Supper here in a few minutes. But I don't want to leave anything for chance because according to Paul, what he wrote to the church at Corinth, he said, some people get sick and even to the point of death because they participate unworthily. And what I mean by that is, is if you're not a child of the king or if you have sin in your life that's unconfessed, you shouldn't take part in the Lord's Supper. That's a decision that you should make, right? Everybody with me? So just so there's no misunderstanding about what, what it means to be a child of God, let me share with you God's plan for salvation. Now, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments. Anybody ever heard that phrase? They were never called the Ten Suggestions, or if I get eight out of ten, I'm good, right? So it was ten of God's laws. The first four were set up to talk about our relationship between us and our Lord. The next six were our relationship with each other. Here's the thing. When we think about it, God set up the law to be a tutor, to say, this is the standard that I expect from my people. The fact is, is have any of us ever broken one of God's ten laws? If nobody's holding up their hand, then you've just broken one of them. You're a liar, okay? <laughs> So now you're on the hook. So when we stop and we think about that, God says, well, I expect you to be holy as I'm holy. I expect you to be perfect as I am perfect. But the problem is we're fallible beings. We're humans, right? We make mistakes. So God said, if you break my law, then you don't deserve heaven. He said, the fact is, though, somebody's got to pay that sin debt. So we have to first realize we've broken God's law and by extension God's heart. But the second thing that we have to do is we have to recognize that if somebody doesn't pay that sin debt, we're not going to be eligible for heaven. That's what Christ's death on the cross did. He paid for all past, current, and future sin for you and for me. Christ gave his own blood on that cross at Calvary to pay your sin debt in mind. Make sense? But then the best part is, is he was placed in a tomb and three days later he walked out and that defeated death for all eternity. Isn't that kind of cool? But in order to be a Christian, we not only have to believe that, but we have to cry out. And the Bible says, if we pray and ask God to forgive us of our sin, he is faithful to forgive us those sins, right? But it also talks about how when we pray and confess that we're a sinner and ask Jesus to cover that sin debt for us, and then decide, and this is the most important piece, decide who's going to be the Lord of your life. Are you going to need to be the Lord of your life, or are you going to give that over to Jesus and let him be Lord? Once you decide the lordship issue, that's when you can know that you've been saved for all eternity. And then we would hope that you would follow in believer's baptism and things like that. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to pray over us here in just a couple of seconds. And I'm going to ask uh, our uh, Ben Breedlove and Dickie Campbell to come up and help you know, with the Lord's Supper. But before we do, I need you to spend just a moment or two in prayer. Ask the Holy Spirit to search you. If there's anything in your life that would be displeasing to God, confess it. Come before God with clean hearts and clean hands. Come ready to sit at the table and partake of those. Can we do that? So I'm going to let you pray silently for just a moment, and then I'll close this out in just a second. Father, I just...
can't help but believe that there's probably someone in here today if they were to die today they don't know where they would spend eternity father i just pray through the power of the holy spirit right now that you would go through here convict hearts father do whatever it takes in your perfect love to say i want you to come home i want you to be a child of mine father if there's any doubt allow them to confess and cry out to you and say lord save me father i know i've sinned word thought deed things i've done things i've left undone you know things that father i know displease you so father just work in our hearts if there's anyone here who is your child but has sin in their life father just bring it readily to the front of their mind that they can confess it and you can forgive and restore that fellowship as we get ready to remember probably the most solemn of all your ordinances here father i just pray that this will be a sweet time that you would be a, this worship would be a sweet savor to your nostrils and we're going to pray that in the holy name of jesus amen